the door to our understanding and it helps us to make sense out of everything else about him. This attribute infiltrates all the other attributes and what's significant and important to understand is our God does not conform to any standard created by others. And the reason why I say that is he is the standard. Therefore, he demands that his creation conform to his standard. In Exodus chapter 15, we are able to see a great picture of God's holiness as Moses and the sons of Israel sing about their deliverance from Pharaoh and his army. Moses ultimately gives the impression that if you want to understand the majesty, the distinctiveness, the uniqueness of God, you have to understand it in concert with his holiness. The Hebrew word for holy means separate. It's the same root word from which we get the words saint and sanctified. All three of these carry the meaning to be separate or distinct. That is why Again, in Exodus chapter 3, God told Moses at that burning bush, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. When we as people of faith come to understand how high and holy God is, that's when we become aware of how little and how small we really are. Until we have seen ourselves as God sees us, We are not likely to be much disturbed over conditions around us as long as they do not go or get so far out of hand as to threaten our comfortable way of life. We have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. God's holiness stands apart, unique, unapproachable, uh, incomprehensible, and unapproachable. Brothers and sisters, I want to announce to you today that God's holiness and that he is holy and that's ultimately who he is, that's what he represents, that's what he's really all about and his holiness is the very central component of who he represents. His name is Frederick William Faber, and he pins these wonderful words about the holiness of our God. This is what he says. He says, how dread are thine eternal years, O everlasting Lord, by prostrate spirits day and night incessantly adored. How beautiful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be, thine endless wisdom, boundless power, and all Oh, how I fear thee, living God, with deepest, tenderest fears, and worship thee with trembling hope and penitential tears. The holiness of God. The righteousness of God. The the purity and cleanness of God. These beautiful attributes, these matchless and wonderful attributes give us a portrait that our God is above all other beings, for there is simply none like him. Our God is holy, holy, holy. And as we come to our biblical text this morning, as we examine this text written by the Apostle Peter, he gives strong theological teachings on why we should never, ever be discouraged as believers in Jesus Christ. The reason why we can shout 
and we can come into this place every Sunday morning and get excited is because God has deposited in our spirits joy, peace, and power as Peter provides an eloquent argument descriptively articulated in verses 3 to three through 12. Now what I love about this text, brothers and sisters, before we even get to verses 13 through 16 in the pretext, yeah. contextually, yes, it gives us this beautiful portrait of God's wonderful, amazing grace and his beautiful love expressed to us in the person of Jesus Christ and the whole fact of him being hung, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago. The gospel story helps us to know that he died a vicarious death and in him doing that we now have a beautiful, wonderful expectation to know that whatever trouble, whatever The reason why I highlight these verses is because the initial word in our preaching text is the word therefore. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've been taught and I've shared with you all the number of times that whenever you see the term therefore in the text, we need to ask the question, what is the there for? Well, I'm glad you asked, so, so here's my response. Y'all asked, y'all didn't even know it, but you asked. And how he died of vicarious death and took our place on what we affectionately call Good Friday. After having died and being placed in Joseph of Arimathea's borrowed tomb, ultimately he stayed there all night Friday. Y'all know the gospel story. He stayed there all day Saturday according to the biblical story, but right early, Sunday morning. Somebody ought to get happy with me right here. He got up with all. moment, I've been trying to get you to see that in the text right now, we have brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have a living hope. Oh. See, see, see. I think, I think, brothers and sisters, some of us, the reason why we never get excited in the church worship experience on Sunday morning is because our hope is dead. Yeah. It's because many of our hopes have died under the pressures of life. That we come up against in this life experience, but if you have a living hope, you can get excited, you can lift glad hands, you can say thank you, Lord, because you know that your hope is alive and you don't have to die in the waiting room. You can have a blessed assurance to know that Jesus is mine, all oh, but a foretaste of glory divine, because I'm an heir of salvation. I've been purchased by God. I've been He got up bright early on that third day morning, and that gives us 
a living hope. Uh, now, I, I, I thought about this in preparing for the message, and, and I considered it, and I remember, I, I did, I, I really remember that it was Reverend Jesse Jackson yeah. all right, in uh, July. July the 19th, 1988, Reverend Jesse Jackson at the D Democratic National Convention, he coined that phrase, keep hope alive. Yeah, yeah. He did. He coined the phrase, he made it a popular phrase that we got to keep hope alive, that, that he was on the midst and on the verge of losing his second run and being president of the United States. He tried in 1984, it didn't work. He tried work. But he told those people in his last stand, at the last opportunity that he had to address his followers, he said, brothers and sisters, don't worry about me. I've got a hope. A living hope. And I believe Jesse Jackson looked at 1 Peter chapter 1 and he told those people where he was at the Democratic National Convention, he says, keep hope alive. And Reverend Trey Thomas right here, 2222 Gray, on the corner of Gray and Backstrap and Third Ward, He says, gird your mind for action. 
y'all. Yeah, I like it because Peter is essentially saying, get your mind right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he's saying. He's saying, get your mind right. How do we do this, Peter? He says, gird your mind. To gird in the first century provided the picture of a priest who wore a long robe because that's what they wore in the first century. This priest would wear this long robe and they would gather up, gird up that long robe and tie it around their waist so they could move quickly and free. Yeah. So we should also gird up our minds and do whatever it takes to focus our thoughts on those things that allow us to serve God successfully. All the while, hear me when I tell you, eliminating any thoughts that would trip us up and cause us to stumble and fall. You got to Understand and 
know that we as adults, from time to time, uh, we're going to engage in and participate in an occasional adult beverage. Can I just talk real to somebody in the back? I want to talk to some real people right now because you might not admit it, but I know many of us from time to time will have an adult beverage. We'll drink a little bit. But Peter is trying to make the point is that the drinking that we drink should not overwhelm us, overtake us. And your occasional drinking should not be an occasional drink every day. Shaped by God's life. A life 
Yeah. Amen. People of God, it's as simple as this. Believers should not pattern their lives after the desires that control them when they were not Christians. Amen. When they did not know God's ways. Yeah. Again, the Apostle Paul helps us right here. He's the contemporary of Peter. And he says famously in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, many of you know this passage. It's a wonderful passage. He says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable and pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Then he says, verse number 2, and be not conformed to the patterns of And now he helps us to know that when you know better, you ought to do better. That, that since you know the truth, now you can live free. Because whom the Son is set free, he's free indeed. That, that, that brothers and sisters, I've come to discover this. I, I, I really have. Uh, by way of practicality, I've learned that sinful living is a prison. When you live sinfully, it imprisons you. Wrong. It causes you to think wrong. It causes you to behave wrong. And you get sucked into this lifestyle. And you get caught up in this lifestyle. And it becomes a stronghold. It begins as a toehold that advances into a foothold. And then it becomes a stronghold. And so you got to learn how to tear down the stronghold. You have to get free. And so you can live a life that's pleasing under God.
retrieves what was documented in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. God emphatically says to his people, be ye holy as I am holy. This imperative given by God indicates a lifestyle of holiness that says I have been set apart to live a life dedicated totally, totally to God and separated totally from the sin of this world. Yeah. In essence and in a concise statement, he says, I've been redeemed. Amen. 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 I've been blood washed. Yeah. Yeah. I've been purchased. Yeah. My life is not, let's go, my own. Yeah. To you, I belong. Yeah. I give myself give myself away. And see, you got to learn how to do that, brothers and sisters. You got to understand that we've been bought with a price. That the blood of Jesus that covers our lives purchased our sin debt. And now since we're covered, we have a holy obligation and a spiritual responsibility to live holy and pleasing unto our holy God. He said, be holy as I am holy. Now he gave this instruction in Leviticus chapter 11. 44 and 45 to the children of Israel because they were to be the chosen people of God to mimic and symbolically represent who God was to the pagan nations. They were to represent God. They were to behave like God. They were to respond in faith to God so that everybody else could see this is how God responds. They were not the kind of people that would get an attitude real quick. They were not the kind of people that would straight real fast. They were the kind of people that would love. They were the kind of people that would cover and not hate on individuals that are suffering and are in a negative position. I wish I could tell somebody here today that we've got to learn how to be holy. We've got to learn how to say, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to magnify your name. And holiness is not just a verbal response. It is a behavioral response. That we ought to not just be holy in word, we ought to be holy in deed. We ought to take care of people that can't take care of themselves. We ought to love people that don't know what love looks like. I wish I had somebody that would help me run along through here. We ought to be a holy people. I like what Peter says in the second chapter. In the second chapter of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, he says that we are a chosen generation. We are a, a, a peculiar people that we may proclaim the praises of him who brought us out of the darkness and has now inserted us into the marvelous light. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. It's an imperative. It is a command. He, he, he tells them that we have been redeemed. That, that, that we've been bought with a price. And I'm just wondering, I don't know, I'm looking at you and you looking at me, but I wonder, is there anybody here redeemed? Because he said he direct my pain. He said he order my steps. Because 
Turn it around. 